Hey guys, my name is The Cherno. Welcome back to another episode of the Game Engine series. If you're wondering why this angle is looking slightly different to usual, it's because somehow I managed to take both of my tripods home on the weekend and leave them both at home. So, we are using a light stand and the camera's a bit further away. So, now that that's out of the way, not that anyone asked, how's everyone doing today? <laughs> we, can, we can resume the the greetings of the series. So basically, for those of you who have not been around for the last few episodes, uh, which I am uploading to YouTube actually as we speak, uh, we've basically progressed past all of the main kind of, um, kind of first iteration of the scripting engine to the point where now we can basically try and actually make something with Hazel. And doing so is going to both kind of well, it'll be like a fun little holiday season project for us, if you will. But also, it's going to test a lot of the actual engine and let us kind of fill in the gaps for things like, you know, the scripting API. So that's kind of why we're doing it. Um, and so we're going to basically uh, make some sort of game. Now, last episode, we kind of had a had a bit of a chat with, with chat. And we decided that we would make some kind of like physics-based puzzle game. And we actually played a bit of Armadillo Run at the end of the stream. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, that's like a game that I remembered from like high school uh, that everyone used to play and share around and stuff. So it's like a little game where you... It's almost like you have to solve a puzzle. Actually, you know what it's like, guys? I didn't mention this last episode, but what's that like... What is that game? The Incredible Machine. I think that's what I'm thinking of. Is that what it is? Is that it? Yeah, I think it is. It's almost kind of like that. Does anyone know that game? Anyway, it's kind of like that. So you kind of have to... Let me just switch, switch to my screen. Switch to my screen. Um, so you kind of have to like, you have like a level, it's almost like a bit of a level editor in and of itself, but you have like a level, um, and you have to get like, you know, the ball from one point to another, and you can do so by like creating a bunch of, uh, you know, using a bunch of different like types of blocks and tools and like gadgets and whatever to basically get from point A to point B. So that's kind of like... I guess what we've decided to make. Uh, I don't know exactly why and how that came about, but I think um, <clears throat> I think the reason why we wanted to do that actually is because uh, I'm just trying to sort something out. Um, because it's more or less it's going to take advantage of physics, and obviously, like we have physics, physics works, and I thought it would be cool to maybe. Um, kind of make something, make, make a game that's kind of physics-based. I think someone I remember in chat actually even suggested something like Angry Birds, but uh, rather than like demolishing certain structures, we thought um, maybe it would be cool to kind of, you know, get from basically point A to point B. So basically in summary, we have like a puzzle game, I guess, where you have to get from like, you know, the start to kind of like the finish, wherever it is. And you have to do so by, I guess, using like certain physics based objects or whatever and maybe based on like how you use them and whatever like there could be like some sort of cost associated with different tools that you use but the idea is maybe you're like some kind of ball and you have to roll uh, and get to the finish like eventually I don't know if you necessarily need to be a ball um, <laughs> we will talk about who the player is um, maybe it's like you can like insert a face in here and <laughs> you have to <laughs> get the face to the finish. I don't know. Um, but that's kind of what I'm thinking. So let's get started with that kind of idea. Now, everyone who's here early in chat right now, I'm going to need you guys to remember that. And when people ask in chat what on earth is going on, you can tell them so that I don't have to. Good. Okay. So the first thing we need to do is actually make a new project because this is like the sandbox project and we don't want to make the game inside here. So this is kind of fun in a way because we're going to actually... Uh, kind of go through what it's like to make a new project. And I'll show you guys how that even works. Um, we'll probably have to make this in like a separate repository as well. 
Um, because, like, I, we obviously don't really want to ship this maybe with the engine. I mean, it could be, like, a demo game for the engine, but still, it should. I don't think it should ship with the engine. It should just be, like, a, you know, publicly accessible additional repository for the actual project itself. So, uh, what we're going to do then is basically, like, I guess in here... I might make a new folder and we'll call this... So we need a, like a, a name for this. Uh, this is the worst part of everything. We have to come up with a name. How about we call it Face Run? <laughs> the reason why I'm calling it Face Run is because Armadillo Run was that other game and I had the idea of putting someone's face into here and then getting them to like the finish. So... Um, it's called face run um one word so <laughs> what we're going to do to create face run is if we go into um the current repository and we, we have a, our sandbox project which is fantastic because what we can actually do is uh oh, sorry it's not this it's um inside hazelnut sandbox project we can just copy sandbox project and plop it into here and then if we open up the project file we can change this to be called face run uh, I can even copy the scenes exactly. Um, I'll just call this face run. And then that's actually kind of it. Uh, like we have this, like we'll delete, we can delete like the binaries and the intermediates and all that. We'll leave the source. I'll just change um, maybe premake.lua, the premake5.lua file to be called face run instead of sandbox. So everywhere it says sandbox, basically, we will replace that with face run. This is the stupidest thing ever. Um, and then, uh, okay, so that's going to complain about the path because if we look at it, it's actually going to try and find that. So this is kind of where um, you either ship this with Premake or you uh, have some kind of like central location on your computer maybe that contains it or you can link to a current version like whatever your currently active version of Hazel is. That's how we do it in Hazel Dev. We have like an environment variable here. Um, but you can always just ship it, as I mentioned, with Premake. So we might actually just do that. We might just copy Premake into Face Run. So we have vendor premake, uh, and so we don't really have to. I think we can just do maybe something like that. Um, and so if we, oh, that's an entire thing. I guess I just wanted this. Uh, and then if we try and, oh, but that's maybe that has to go back to. And then if we run that. Okay, that almost worked, but there's like some pre, uh, pre-made customization. Yeah, I don't think we need like this, to be honest. So let's just get rid of that. Uh, okay, and now we actually do need Hazel Script Core. So this is where you have to basically point it to where it is on your computer. So I mentioned this, but like if we go to our environment variables, um, you can see there's this Hazel directory here. Uh, and that's how, that's how we basically know which installation of Hazel we're using. This is for Hazel Dev, right? So this is like a, you know, a Hazel kind of 3D thing. Um, what we can do though, is we can make our own, I'll call this Hazel 2D directory, sure. Um, and we can set this equal to be uh, basically the root of wherever our current installation is. Now in real Hazel, like in big Hazel, this happens through the UI. Um, and it happens more or less automatically, like the launcher can manage it as well. But basically, um, <clears throat> but basically, uh, it, you can kind of create this environment variable yourself, of course, manually, and you can reset it to whatever you want. And really the only reason why this exists and why it has to exist is because we need to kind of link our app to some kind of library that is Hazel, right? That contains like our entire scripting API. And so we basically need to know where that is. And that's kind of what our Hazel root directory is. Now in this case, it's set to this, but um, what we need to do is instead of that, we can actually read like an environment variable. And I forget how exactly to do that. I know that we're doing that actually already for um, I think our dependencies, yeah, so OS get an env. So if we also do that for here, so we can do local that equals hazel uh, 2d directory, then that should be that. Um, and then I think just like we do uh, in here where we use it, we can just kind of use it like that. 
right? Um, to basically have this. So I think we can probably just do that, right? And instead of Vulcan SDK, it's going to be this guy. Um, and so we're joining that with Hazel script core, and you'll see that in the base of our repository, we have that Hazel script core. So everything should hopefully work there. So that's what... Okay. Um, so it's not obviously not reading that variable. I think we're using the wrong... Um, like quotation marks or something. Maybe not. No, that does look uh, correct. Oh, maybe it's because it's in like quotes or something. I mean, in parentheses. No. That's weird. So what's the difference between this and this? Is it because it's an include? Hmm, weird. Well, we could try and just do root directory and then concatenate it with that and then put that into to parentheses. Okay, so that worked. Um, but then this doesn't work. Yeah, and that's that might actually be because of... Okay, let's go back to Sandbox. That might be because we're, we should be including that additional thing that someone made. I'm not exactly sure how that works because I didn't make it. I don't know who did, but um, where was this? Sandbox project in Hazelnut. Yeah, if we look at the script, if the, we look at the pre-make for that, it includes this guy. So let's also, I guess, do that. Um, and let's see if that works. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so we just didn't need to remove that line. As long as we have that environment variable set, then it will be able to read the root directory and then everything else will basically work. So that's kind of how I handle that usually. And so what that's done is it's created a face run solution. And so we have a new project. Um, so now let's go ahead and try and load this. So the way I'm going to load it is, um, well, if we just launch Hazelnut and we don't have a command line argument set, it's actually going to ask us what we want to load. So if we just go back and we go to face run and we try and open up face run, you can see hopefully it's now loaded face run. Now, how do we know that it's loaded face run? Well, I guess we don't really. Um, <laughs> we assume that it has, but what I can do is like in this kind of main physics project, I can just like try and delete some stuff, which does the delete key not work? Oh, damn, we can't delete entities. Excellent. Uh, is it this? Yeah, probably. No, actually it's a context destroy entity entity and then that tries to do register destroy and then it can't get the ID component. Oh no, this. But aren't we destroying the entity? So shouldn't that be that? Because otherwise we don't have the UID anymore. It's a bit weird. Maybe just like a little oversight. So let's try and delete that. Okay, now it works. So if we just delete that and then we like save it. And then if, <laughs> if I open it uh, and we go back and we actually open Sandbox Project. Yeah, it's still there. But then if I open project and we open face run, it's not there, okay? So it does indeed seem to be a completely different project, which is good. Um, but yeah, we've copied sandbox project and that's kind of how it works. Like in the beginning, that's kind of what you, what you do, right? Like before you kind of have a new project button that maybe beautifully sets up a new completely blank template and set of scenes and set of parameters and scripts and all of that stuff. You can just kind of take that existing sandbox project, make a duplicate of it, obviously, and then just edit it. Um, and that's kind of how new projects work as well. Like you make a template, you basically set up a project that is kind of blank. It's called like whatever you want it to be called. 
and it has like all the standard parameters set, all the standard kind of scripting behaviors set, maybe some boilerplate code, maybe some, you know, like uh, kind of starter asset pack or something like that, just contains stuff that you might need. And then, yeah, and then you just kind of copy that into whatever directory the user specifies and then there's your new project. So it's not really a big deal to kind of have a new project workflow, I think. And as I mentioned, like some engines like don't develop that for quite a while because it's just not something that um, you need, technically speaking. Now for Hazel, we kind of do want to have that though. Uh, the reason being that obviously this is kind of like a little engine that, you know, every kind of engine, every engine that's trying to maybe be somewhat of an engine rather than just shipping a game kind of needs that because like in Unity or Unreal, you might want to quickly set up a new project to just try something out. And obviously having like a new project workflow is kind of important for that. You don't want to just have to annoyingly keep copying stuff, you know, and then modifying it. That definitely takes longer than making a new projects. So I'm not saying that it's not necessary. Um, and we will definitely implement it at some later kind of stage. Uh, Hazel, like Big Hazel has that. It has a launcher and you can actually create a new project from that. And I've tested that. In fact, if you guys watched my video from like a year ago of me making a 3D, like, a, I don't know, I think it's called like making a game in Hazel in one hour again or something like that. Making a game in my engine, in my own engine in one hour again. <laughs> anyway, when I made that like rocket uh, kind of Flappy Bird game, uh, I opened the launcher and I pressed new project and that's where we started from. So that's the kind of workflow you can expect. Uh, but anyway, so now that we've got this, uh, let's kind of think about how this is going to work. So, um, I mean, yeah, like, look, uh, I think text rendering is going to be important because we need to obviously render like, um, you know, if we have any kind of in-game currency or any kind of main menu, we kind of need text rendering. I mean, we could, of course, just... Like for currency and for stuff like that, like if we have like, you know, a certain amount of money, people can spend kind of, uh, you know, creating this level design uh, in the actual game. Then, of course, we want some kind of like uh, text rendering for that and for score and for all of that stuff. But for the main menu, technically, we could just like open up Photoshop and create a texture that has text in it. Um and then of course just load that image into Hazel and then you're kind of done. So that's a bit of a, a hacky way and it's probably not like the best thing to do. Well, it's, it's definitely not the best thing to do just for games in general because, um, well, for numerous reasons, uh, not even talking about things like localization, it's also bad because, um, you know, we just have these textures <laughs> uh, which obviously are going to be resolution dependent and are going to take up like GPU memory and be annoying, you know, a bit more resource heavy probably, uh, rather than just having some like sign distance field font. Um, so we should probably take a look honestly at uh, text rendering in the near future. Cause this, like now that I'm thinking about it, this game is probably gonna be a little bit difficult without us doing that. Um, so maybe we can do that like, soon uh because yeah i just realized i just forgot that we just don't have <laughs> text rendering uh in the actual game engine okay um but that being said let's like kind of let's just like i can't believe the delete key okay first of all why does the delete key not delete like whose idea was that did that just never get implemented or did I, does someone remove that? I don't know. Um, okay. Let's just add a little, now the, the problem is like the, the thing with this is that like, if we take a look at where this is happening and one of the problems that we have at the moment is that this like editor layer, um, obviously the editor layer, like what is the editor layer? That's like, the layer that is kind of responsible for really the entire editor application, right? Like this entire application is all completely running from this thing, from this kind of class called the editor layer. And so if we actually handle an on key pressed event in here, that it's kind of like a, just a global key press event. So wherever you are, if you press delete, like this code will basically run. 
Now, why is that an issue? It's an issue because, te like, usually, shortcuts or any kind of keys, like, on your keyboard, they're usually context sensitive, meaning that, like, it depends what context you're in. That kind of determines their behavior. Unlike the mouse, because the mouse, like, you can point at things and you click on things. So you kind of obviously know, like, if I right click and hit delete, clearly I'm in the scene hierarchy. That's the context. But you can imagine that if you just kind of hit the delete key, like, you know, are you trying to delete an entity? Are you trying to delete one of these folders down here? Are you trying to, I don't know, delete some text from, like, you know, a text edit kind of component here? Like or a UI kind of widget is what I mean. Like the delete key does a lot of things and it depends completely on the context. So what we kind of need to think about is rather than just implementing delete to just be like, oh yeah, we press the delete key, you know, let's just go to like the current active scene and let's just, you know, if there's a selected entity, let's like destroy it. And we can actually do that if we just, I think ask the scene hierarchy panel we can ask it like what the selected entity is. like if there's a selected entity basically so entity selected entity um and then if that's like a valid entity so if anything is selected we can just kind of destroy it and like yeah that's valid um and it will probably work well in this case i think that has a let's try to delete something that doesn't have a script associated with it Oh, that doesn't work either. Wonderful. Okay, so that just doesn't work. On overlay render. Draw selected entity outline. Um, that's a little weird. Oh, okay. So, no. So, hmm. So, the problem with this is get selected entity selection context. Like, if we delete that, then the scene hierarchy panel kind of needs to know that. Um, or you can just do, like, a, an on selection change or something. Because, so set selected entity. Yeah, so I guess what we should do here is, if that's the case, like, we kind of need to make sure that we actually, you know, set. And this is kind of, this should probably be done in a bit more of a global way. But we can just destroy like the selected entity like that. So basically now I think that will work. So you can see I can go through and I can delete everything. With the delete key, of course that works. But the problem, <laughs> which you might not realize is, I mean, I mean, you will realize this pretty quickly, is if I'm like, you know, in here editing my speed and I'm like, oh, I don't want 1.235, I just want 1.5 and I hit delete, then, well, actually that doesn't delete the entity. I was full on expecting that to delete the entity. Ah, oh. okay. How does that work? Let's try that again, because I have a feeling it's not as good as it sounds. So if I select the entity and I change this to, I put my thing there and let's just say the mouse is over the viewport and I hit delete. Yeah, you can see it deletes it. So actually it, only, it deletes stuff. It depends where your mouse is. So apparently if the mouse is over the viewport, then it does delete things. If the mouse is not over the viewport, it doesn't. Um, and I don't know exactly how that's working. Um, like, I'm just wondering, like, do we just not get shortcuts if we're not in the viewport? There's something disabling that. So like if we put a, if I just put a breakpoint here and I, yeah. Okay. So for some reason. For some reason, on key pressed only happens if the mouse is over the viewport. And I think I remember something vaguely. Yeah, so viewport hovered. I think if, you, if the viewport isn't hovered, it like disables events. Yeah, so here it is. So application get I'm GUI layer block events, not viewport hovered. So if viewport isn't hovered, then block events is true, which means that events are blocked. So that's actually why, but that's obviously still incorrect. Um, Cause it's cool that we don't like, and it's probably not very correct that we just don't receive events at all. But still, if I'm here editing this and my mouse is over the viewport and I just hit the delete key cause I'm, you know, editing this. Let me get rid of the breakpoint. 
So I'm going through this, I'm editing this, I hit backspace, I hit delete, ah, the entity is gone. Like, that's terrible. Um, and so that's kind of why ultimately this is not like as straightforward as a solution as you might hope, because there's a little bit more to this than just kind of um, making like the delete key globally work uh, like that. So the way that this is properly implemented is it just needs to basically like any kind of key event needs to always kind of flow through a, a path, I guess, that is is contextual. So edit a layer on key pressed is so, like almost nothing should be here unless it truly is a global hotkey. Uh, and even then for things like text editing, that should just completely disable all, all, everything, right? So I think there's something we can actually do. There's something we can actually do where, and I think it's probably worth doing this now, um, where if we take a look at, um, yeah, cause I mean, we're doing this. Okay, so we're doing this here. Um, so I am GUI actually has, I think we're already kind of doing this, aren't we? Well, we definitely are in Hazel 3D and we're in Hazel, in big, in big boy Hazel. Um, so I think, let's just try that. So, what's it called? Might have to include I'm going internal. There's like this G. Ugh. Okay, I, I don't really remember this. Draconan first. Draconan first. Thank you for the prime sub. Appreciate the support. Um, sorry, guys. Wait a sec. Uh, there's, okay, so if we look at I am GUI, I guess internals, sure. I'm just trying to find the, yeah, I don't, I don't really know where this is and I'm not going to Google it, so I'm just going to look through the code for a while. Hope you guys are okay with that. <laughs> um, I mean, there's some kind of like active, some active, active ID or... Yeah, I think it's active ID. Aha, uh -huh, active widget. So active ID. Um, so there's all this stuff. It's hovered and active. And active, I believe, means that you are actually like there. Um, now active widget will want to read those key inputs. So there's active ID using key input mask and there's some other things that you can kind of, uh, you know, use, I guess, to figure out what's actually active, but active ID. So active ID. So what's this is inside I'm GUI context and I'm GUI context, which is this big thing. Um, let's try and find where that's stored. So I, inside I'm going window, but there's like some kind of, I think you can, you can definitely, yeah, I'm going, aha, uh -huh, this is, this is, is it, G, I am GUI. Okay, I found it. 
So this is what I was looking for. And that lets us, so to access that though, you have to include I am going internal. So I believe it's not actually in here. Yeah, see that's an error. So just make sure that you include I am going internal. And then you can just be like, hey bro, what is the active ID? And the reason why I'm doing this is because I wanna actually take a look, for example, in delete, I wanna just have a look at what this is. So if we just do HZ core, well actually this is such a kind of interesting thing that we, you might wanna actually make like some kind of panel even called like I'm GUI debug or something. And you can just have that stuff there. So I mean, like we have a panel called like stats and I guess settings like, Sure, maybe in stats, just this is temporary ultimately, but I want to make like in stats uh, and an active ID is an I'm GUI ID, which is what, like a 64 bit. Uh, it's just an unsigned int. So, oops, um, take me back. So, what I can do is just do like I'm GUI text, uh, I'm GUI active ID, uh, and then we just do dollar um, percentage sign D and active ID like that, right? So this is gonna just show us what like the currently active ID is, including what, so zero, you can see it currently says zero. Um, and then if I click on something, you can see it actually says an ID, but then if I let go, it disappears. So this is not like, this is like, you know, cause when you click on it, you kind of activate this and you can see it's all kind of here. Um, and I think like this should be an unsigned int, which we just do U for that. And with UD. That's not showing up. <laughs> no, it's still showing up negative. Whatever. Um, so. But the idea is if we actually do, if we are editing something, hey, see, so I, I have let go of the mouse button and I'm editing something, but you can see this active ID is not uh, nothing, right? So it's still kind of there and same with this, but when I click out of it, it's gone, right? So this is kind of nice because if something's like actually active, right? Because we're using it actively, uh, you know, like this stuff, you can see that it's gonna stay active. So, oh, I did it on the wrong text, did I? Oh yeah, whoops. Thanks, Fake Lobster. <laughs> so is this gonna work now? Yeah, so, oh, it's just you, I think. Yeah, so I was right the first time. I just did it on the wrong thing. Yeah, um, so now it doesn't have the negative. It doesn't matter though. Uh, there's no real reason for that. Um, so yeah, so what we can do basically is, and this is what I'm curious about. I'm just, I just don't know how. Um... No, nah, well, like honestly, all we have to do, I guess, is just basically see, um, like if we, if we kind of, just in get I am GUI layer, because that's specific, specific to I am GUI, we can just do UN32T uh, get active widget ID, right? And then that can just kind of do what we just did, right? Which is this. So if I paste that in here and I just return that, uh, and then we just come over here and we grab I'm GUI internal and I'll, I'll cut it out of there because we don't need it there. Hmm. Get rid of that. Um, and then we can probably just do that just to keep it a bit more simple. Um, then here, if we grab this guy, when we're about to hit the delete key, we can just say if that is specifically zero, then we allow that to happen. Otherwise we don't do it. 
and yes, there are better ways of handling this like longer term because we probably just want to have a global stay where it's like, do not allow like this hotkey to, to run under these circumstances. But for now, at least what that means is that if I actually am editing this text and I hit delete, you can see it does not delete the entity. However, if I'm not and I hit delete, you can see it does. So that's kind of how we can get that behavior more or less working without trying too hard. Because we don't want to try too hard. That'd be bad. Okay, cool. So, excellent. Um, so let's start making this game. So, yeah, like, I mean, I don't know. What am I thinking? Like some kind of ball and you have to roll it down here. And like what? Maybe the camera follows the ball or something like that. So how would we set that up? Um, well, we already have like a camera following the player. So I think the player really should be some kind of ball though. So let's kind of basically uh, remove the box collider. Let's remove the sprite renderer. Let's add a circle renderer. But the thing is, I kind of, if it's really face run and we have someone's face, which I guess I'll start with my face. But the idea is you plug in a face. Okay, well, I have two faces here. I have me, and I, I have this image of Peter for some reason in my, and this is just in my, um, <laughs> and this is just in my, uh, um, pictures folder on this user account that I use for streaming. So, um, Peter's a little bit low resolution, so we'll go with me. Um, I guess we're up in Photoshop. And I guess what we'll do is, okay, so I think what we'll do is definitely not a circle renderer. So we'll go with the sprite renderer and we'll put in that texture in a minute. Ugh, I'm gonna have to like sign in probably. Give me like five seconds, guys. Does anyone get this every single time they sign in? And then I have to like relaunch it. Thanks Radiator for the sub. Even, even this is actually is like 700 by 700. What a stupid photo. I don't even know why this is here. Like where is this from? Okay, whatever. Um, so let's get like, uh, how do I make this a circle? Uh, I guess I'll just get like this thing and then can I just like, should I eyeball this? Yeah, that's pretty good, right? No, that's a bit too big. Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay. Well, actually, no, let's not do that. Let's um, just add a uh, mask. Uh, and then... Wait, where's my selection? I did that the other way round. Um, so I wanted this to be black and this to be, all right, this to be white. Okay, and the benefit here is that I can drag this around maybe. No, not because it's on the same layer. Ugh, whatever. I just want to center this. No, I don't want to select subject. Um, and that's gonna make the whole thing. I guess I just wanted this mask on like a separate layer or something. 
so that I could just make it. That's really annoying. Okay, actually, it's totally fine. I'll just make this bigger. Oh, it's working now somehow. I don't know why it's working now and it wasn't before. Okay, so my stupid face here, which, again, this is just the image I had in my pictures folder for some reason. Must have used it for something. So if we export that, um, and we go into face run assets, textures, Cherno face. Uh, there's Cherno face. Let's apply it here. There he is. <laughs> um, and now let's make it a bit bigger, maybe. <laughs> and um, oh, that's cool. When I like take damage, we can tint it red or something. <laughs> Um, I'm gonna tile it. Pretty cool. Uh, and then we'll add a circle collider to it. Now uh, let's show the physics colliders. So you can see it's got a circle collider on it. So if we run this, you can see. <laughs> uh, that's funny. All right. <laughs> uh, this is so stupid. All right. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so, okay, so we need to get from point A to point B. So let, let's start with some awesome level design. Now, the cool thing is we can make this level as big as we want because, uh, obviously the camera follows the, um, player. So let, let's kind of just draft this up as if like, um, so where is this? So... I guess maybe zero, zero should almost be like, so this is the origin. Maybe this should be the start of each level and then we can kind of build the level downwards. Um, and it's kind of like, okay, you have to get to uh, like, you know, well, let's make some walls that aren't completely stupid. So if I just reset the rotation, maybe let's make it 90. Like we can have some normal kind of, you know, gray walls that kind of just, this is like the edge of the map kind of thing. So uh, not that we really need to have an edge of the map, but why not? What the heck is this? Just a block, just a random block. Does that also fall? It does. Um, let's get rid of that. So I'm making some walls that just define like the map. I guess this is level one, so it probably shouldn't be this big. Um, oh crashed oh the name is like not happy okay good we're in a debug build so what's the name oh that's weird it's selected an entity valid i guess so on duplicate entity duplicate entity new entity entity get name so maybe that's what's wrong it couldn't get the name correctly because it's possible this entity doesn't exist. Hmm. Oh, here we go. Yeah, we have a weird entity here. That shouldn't be there. Hmm. It's weird. Yeah, so basically this entity somehow isn't valid. And I... Is it because we're trying to... Selected entity gets selected entity. So why would... So maybe it's seen hierarchy panel not having a valid entity? I don't know. I'm not really quite sure how that would happen. Because we duplicate this guy. Then we duplicate that guy. Ah, okay. So let's if we if we duplicate an entity twice... Oh, because it doesn't select it properly or does it if i go back to this one oh it's just anyone okay so it looks like maybe after duplicating it doesn't select the entity correctly or something 
Well, either way, once we duplicate the entity, like that, okay, so let's kind of change this a bit. So first of all, duplicate entity should return an entity. Um, and second of all, uh, we should select that new entity. Uh, again, does not explain the crash, but it's just something I want anyway. Um, But yeah, really weird. Uh, I don't know why that would happen. Unless something happens to that old entity, which again, it shouldn't. But who knows? So, Control D. Okay, so now I've actually got the new entity selected. Control D again. Okay, so still happening. Okay, good. Because I don't want, I don't really want to brush that <laughs> under the rug. That's so weird. So let's just add a little core warn. Because we know something's up with the name. Trying to duplicate entity. Selected entity get. Let's do get you UID and name. Um, do it the other way around though. Because I'm just curious if if um, like how that would work. Okay, so let's let's uh, I'll leave this here. We'll look at this as well. So, Control D and Control D. Okay, well, that looks correct, and it definitely seems to get the name correctly. Um, so, like, if this obviously prints correctly. Uh, so, whatever select entity is, with that UUID, that all seems correct. So, something weird's got to happen in, in here, I guess. And see, here it's trying to... Ah, uh, I think I know what's happening. So, entity, so, create an entity with the name goes in here. And then that creates an entity with that name. But then I think what happens is it references the name. And so because it's referencing the name, what happens is when we create a new a new entity here, this reference actually gets dislodged in memory because we're adding to the data structure by actually calling registry create. And well, specifically, I think by adding like a tag component. So this probably dislodges this old thing from memory. And we can actually test that out really easily. If we just do warn name equals, and then let's just do name, and then let's do it again here. So post and pre. And I think, I, cause I'm pretty sure it's this line of code. Cause that's what actually adds the tag component and that will kind of shift that data structure most likely. So if we, uh, duplicate this and duplicate it again and we get that error um, yeah so it works the first time but and that's just probably lucky that's just because the data structure doesn't need to happen but then you can see that prename prints successfully but we never get to postname because we we're probably in the middle of trying to print postname and yes we are okay so that's what happens so what we need to do is if we actually want this name we can't just capture it like that we can't use a string view either we basically need to make a copy of that name um, so that we can kind of set it because this will obviously move it around in memory um, and so like the problem with doing it that way and it's kind of annoying as well is like you really shouldn't do it here um, like I'm not going to do it in here at all because even though it's a bit weird it's actually not the responsibility I would say of this function to deal with it. I think it's more so when we call duplicate entity um, and we call it with entity get name, we shouldn't do that. Um, because that's not gonna be a valid reference. So yeah, this is a little bit, um, I don't know how we wanna handle this. Um, 
But in this case, if you are duplicating and you're keeping the same name, you do have to make some kind of copy of it basically. And then this, so, so this should basically work fine. So it's actually the calling function that is kind of wrong in a way because you're giving it uh, memory that isn't technically going to be around by the time you need it. Yes, yeah, sorry. Bag Lobster's a, a great pair programmer. <laughs> All right, so now, hopefully, I can duplicate as much as I want. All right, so I have a lot of flaws now, um, and everything's fine, okay? I don't know why I restarted, but could have just reloaded the scene. But that seems to work. <clears throat> okay, good, so that's a fairly serious bug, I guess. So let's duplicate this a few times now, and we'll make sure that we have uh, some kind of level here. Looking pretty horrendous. How does that not... How does that... Uh... What? Why is that not zero degrees? It's not zero either. That's why it looks weird. Okay. So we're not gonna... <laughs> uh, we should probably have some kind of like bounciness, right? Or is that gonna be annoying? And yeah, like you can have different like friction materials and stuff, uh, I guess. And actually maybe the camera, oh, you know what would be cool? If the camera zoom kind of depended on the speed. So the faster you go, the more you zoom out basically. That's kind of cool. Uh, let's make that happen. <coughs> So the camera has the player. Um, now, do we know the player's velocity? Uh, I mean, we need, so in order for that to actually, oh, we can move the player as well. So we're probably gonna remove that. But yeah, we need to know the player's velocity, which I don't believe we know at the moment. So I think what we should do is probably inside um, the rigid body component, we need to get linear velocity um, or something like that. So. If we go to Hazel, um, so let's go to script glue. I just want to see, I hope I, hope I saved that scene. <laughs> so there's apply linear impulse body. So can we just do body get linear velocity? Okay, beautiful. So. get linear velocity. <coughs> See, this is what I mean. Like, you're making a game and you can add so much stuff to your engine. Because you need all this stuff. Um, so let's make this a uh, out linear velocity. Get linear velocity. I'm guessing returns like a B2 vec2. actually a const one of these and we can do out linear velocity equals glm vec2 x y and I of course mean this um yeah that's it uh so the actual script, the actual script uh, core though, so components needs to, oops, not this, that, needs to also have that. Now, here's the thing, we can just make this a property. 
right? So vector two, public vector two, linear velocity. Uh, for now, we'll only have a get because that's what we implemented, but I guess you can also do a set and get can just be um, basically, you know, get linear velocity and I guess, I mean, yeah, I guess we'll, I don't know, should the internal call, no, the internal call has to map directly, so um, I guess we'll have to make this like a, one of these guys and then probably do like a vector two uh, velocity or actually um, let's do this instead. So entity.id and then out ve vector two velocity return velocity. So get linear velocity doesn't exist yet, of course. So we'll duplicate that, make that happen. Get linear velocity that returns void and takes in and I guess an out vector to linear velocity. And that's good, I think. Right? Um, and so I guess we can test that by just going to our game and then inside our game in the camera, if we just do uh, log. Oh, console dot, we don't have a log, technically. Console right line, that's another cool feature to have a log in the editor that we can log to from the script. And so this will be mplayer, uh, get component, rigid body 2D component, dot, linear velocity and I know I'm probably shouldn't be getting it every frame like that but that's fine LVX LVY okay we'll build this and we'll run hazel and that should work did you ever get much into front end uh, web dev stuff um I've done web dev for myself and for a few people I know uh, just kind of freelance, but I don't really enjoy it that much, so I only do it if I really like it. Um, but yeah, I've done some front end and some back end web web dev in my day, but not like ever seriously because I was much more interested in game engines and stuff. Um, okay, so did that work? Um, I don't see that being printed. It's weird. Very weird. Why is it not printing? We definitely have the camera. Hopefully it's like loading it from the right place, but it has to be. Well, I can just do, if I just don't do this, then the camera won't move technically. Now oh, it's moving, great. Okay, maybe it's not working. <laughs> That's weird. Is it loading the wrong? Oh, hang on. No, it shouldn't be. Uh, I'm beginning to think maybe it's loading like the wrong script. Because we did make a new project, but face run has a script module path sandbox.dll. Oh, sandbox.dll. So it doesn't even build sandbox.dll. How is that working? Wait a minute. So what does it say here? Sandbox project assets, uh-huh. So it is lo it's loading our old one. How did that happen? So like the script engine should, oh wow, it's hard coded. Okay, I did not expect that. Um, so the app assembly that is supposed to load, I can't believe we didn't do that when we did the project stuff. We um, should have actually looked at the, so the project itself has like 
um, I think the asset directory and relative to that, I think relative to that, we can actually look at the script module directory. So the script module path and we can get the, I guess the config. like this, but this is all, yeah, relative to the active. Well, no, this is static actually, that is. Um, okay, really? like it does oh. okay so um, basically <laughs> that might be what we need what we want uh, let's take a look though Okay, so there's actually no active project. Um, okay, so where are we trying to load this from then? Because we definitely need an active project before we try and initialize the script engine. This is probably happening in application, which is, I guess, incorrect. Yeah, so application does script engine in it. All right. Um, yeah, so let's do that in edit a layer after we basically load. Like when we load a project, open project, uh, which I guess does that, and it does open scene, it should probably initialize the script engine because that's dependent, like the scripting engine obviously is, it needs the project to be loaded and active. Uh, okay. Ah, oh, but we can't, oh, okay. This is a little annoying. So basically, this is a very kind of, so this, yeah. So once we load the project successfully, we can initialize the script engine and then we can try loading a scene because loading a scene also needs the script engine to be initialized. It's a little bit of a, an issue. Okay, and now the script module path is that, which I think is correct. Nope. Um, so what's wrong with that? So face run, and then assets, scripts, binary sandbox.dll, okay. Okay, that's just our bad because um, face run builds face run.dll. So, and we actually, inside our own face run hproj, have sandbox.dll. So, we just need to make sure that when we make the new project, we also adjust that since we've changed the binary. Um, and uh, yeah. And now we're good. Easy as that. Okay, so, I mean, we still follow this and it still doesn't print what I wanted it to, which is <laughs> very suspicious. I, I mean, I took that out. So, that's a bit weird, isn't it? I mean, I'm sure it's loading it. But that, but why is it doing that? We can try and reload it, which does seem to reload it. And I'm definitely editing the right one. Oh, okay, well that works. It's not printing anything. Ah, oh, well. Ah. Oh. Ah, oh, that's if we move up and down. Yeah, okay, so that stuff doesn't even need to exist, I think. Because that's really the only thing that's, that's important. But then, um, what I kind of want it to do... Yeah, why is it not printing this though? That's what's weird. Unless that is erroring. 
which would be weird. We can actually debug as well. Yeah, actually, can we just do Control Shift F7 and then put a breakpoint here? Yeah, we can. <laughs> Pretty cool. Um, zero, zero. Okay. But why is it not printing this? Oh. So it's actually getting a format exception. Um, do I need this here? Is that why? Oops. Let me, let me rebuild that. Hey. Okay, yeah, that looks like it works. Um, cool. So... Um, so what we could do is basically, like, we need to get the speed. Um, and because the speed is a vector, there's a few different ways we can do this. Um, the best way is probably going to be something like, if we could just get the length squared or something like that, that would be ideal. Um, failing that... Uh, well, you know, I mean, we're going to implement this stuff anyway. So let's just do public float length squared. Um, and the reason we're doing a length, so let's just do both. We'll do length squared and length. The reason why we generally like to have a length squared is because for some things, we just need to know, is this number bigger or smaller than another one? Like, for example, if you're comparing two vectors together and you just want to know which one of them is greater, then length squared is perfectly fine because you don't care about the actual length, you just care about, like, the comparison. Um, and to figure out the, the length of a vector, uh, what we technically need to do um, is basically... Um, Uh, is basically just like square every component, right? So if it was a 3D vector, you'd also do that. And then square root the whole thing. So this square root is an extra operation that is like not completely cheap. Uh, and so if we can avoid doing that, so that's what we need to get the actual length. If we can avoid doing that, then in here, we can just do lengths like x squared plus y squared. This is a vector, so just x squared plus y squared, and that's it. That kind of more or less tells us like the magnitude of the vector, but obviously squared because we haven't done the square root, so that's why it's squared. Um, so that's kind of why. So we can just do return. Oh, this is amazing. See, I don't even have to do that. Like, I don't even have to write this. The computer just knows that you're trying to do that based on, I guess, this function. Let's see what it does here. Oh, doesn't know. Oh, AI. <laughs> um, we can just do like math dot square root length squared. Um, but the thing is, I don't really want to use math square root. Like, well, I mean, I guess I'll have to because that that's a double kind of operation, double precision operation. Um, so. Yeah. But anyway, the reason why I'm saying this is because, see, if we're trying to, for example, design a distance from player that increases based on the camera distance, we can just kind of use length squared. Now, that, I guess, does lend itself to an exponentially increasing uh, kind of, you know, situation. So it's not going to be linear like normal length will be, meaning that, you know, if this is like zero units away, one unit away, one meter away, two meters away, three meters away, you can see that with this, it kind of will increase more or less exponentially. But um, that's just something that we can use if we wanted to. Uh, over here, and then ultimately we could just do distance from player equals LS. Uh, and then if player is null, uh, let's just like return. So we won't do anything with the camera if there's no player. keep trying to run that. Yeah, the info is not correct. <laughs> In the stream, I mean. <laughs> Ooh, why did that crash? Ah. 
Weird. Uh, that, that's hilarious. Um, so if we try a more uh, gentle approach, so let's do length, for example, and then let's also maybe do like um, so. Let's do let's do a float distance from player equals distance from player. Um, just so we have a base distance, and then based on that, so that maybe that's the closest it can be. And then we'll do distance from player. Um, basically plus equals player velocity dot length. And of course you want to do this with, like with some lerping and with some, a whole bunch of other stuff. Oh, whoops. Like you don't just want this to be uh, kind of as simple as that. Let's try it. Oops. Let's try something like that. That's funny. Um, so it, we can probably go to camera and make the distance from player like two. So that's like the minimum. <laughs> so the other thing we can do, um, and what I would do is this is where like, it's nice to use a lerp um, because we don't really quite want it to just obviously bounce around like that. Instead, what we want to do is we kind of want to more or less like, uh, and I don't think we have this. We don't have a lerp function, do we? Uh, it's very easy to make a lerp function. We should probably do that like in, uh, in, in a different, in like, um, in like the math library, but a simple lerp, a B T. Um, it's just going to basically be A plus B times T. But the reason why it's not quite that simple is because, um, well, let's see. It's because it depends which values we kind of add to it. Um, or which like parameters we use with it. Because the way that it's used a lot of the times means that something as simple as that won't quite work. And so we tend to do something like, um, basically this. I think that's the, basically the implementation. Or maybe not, maybe there's a simpler version. Or whatever, we'll keep that, that. I think this is actually the better version. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is better because if you do B minus A, depending on the distance between B minus A, um, you basically lose floating point precision. Uh, whereas here, we're not doing that. You'll know, you'll know there's no B, B versus A subtra subtraction ever. Um, it's just one minus T, which is, that's more or less a constant, and then B times T, and then A plus the result of that. Um, but basically, anyway, uh, if we do something like that, the, the reason why this is good is because, um, like, and the thing is, you have to, dip, you have to, um, like, you also have to kind of think about, um, yeah, sorry, I meant multiply, not add. Um, thanks, chat. Uh, so what was I saying? Yeah, you have to think about, like, how this is going to work, because it, and, and I don't mean, like, how to implement it, I mean what you want the behavior to be like, because if the camera is, like, here, um, and it, you want, you're suddenly like, okay, well, my velocity is this, right? My velocity is like pretty low at the moment. So maybe I want to zoom in. So I get a tighter view of the player. Um, the fact is the player's velocity, like always changes. 
And so unfortunately, what that means is that we kind of, we're always, always in a situation where we want to lerp from whatever our current value is to our kind of end value. Now lerps, the way that lerps should work for, is that's a very, very difficult conversation to have because lerps are like, there's more than one way to use a lerp and some of them might seem wrong, but they also kind of achieve desired effects sometimes. Usually the way that you use lerp is if you have a well-defined point A and a well-defined point B, then what you should do is just maintain a T variable that goes from zero to one, however you like it to, usually hopefully linearly. So in other words, you just do T plus equals TS being your time step, and that is it. And if you want it to take two seconds, you can basically multiply this with one over how long you want it to take because that will halve it, this, and that will mean that it gets incremented at half the speed or you just half t either way that's how it should work if you want to have an easy like an ease out or an ease in or an ease in or an ease in and ease out then i like the way we do that in big hazel is we just have a separate uh we have this whole class called like interpolation or interpolate i think and you can do like interpolate dot ease in out and it will kind of do that for you, but the input is always a linear time value. That's how I prefer to do things. I think that's the way it should work. And that's that. Now, sometimes though, what people will do is if they have a target that is always changing. So in other words, let's just say we are the current camera distance from player. If that is in any way tied to the speed of the player, it's constantly changing. So what people do, which again, is technically wrong, but sometimes it feels nice, is they will, instead of passing a T value from zero to one into the lerp function, they will pass a constant like 0 0.9, for example, or like 0. Point, I don't know, something. And then they pass in A. So basically they'll do something like A equals lerp A B, and then 0 0.9 or something. And so what the reason why this is technically incorrect is because A, you can see, appears here twice. And so what that kind of means is that you're putting in a value that you then assign back to, and obviously this is happening every frame. Uh, and also your value here is, is kind of a constant, which is weird, like that's not, when you think of a linear interpolation, it's like point A, point B, please tell me a value somewhere along this line right? That's kind of what a linear interpolation should be like. But the thing is, if you just say, give me a constant value along the line, say 0 0.9, which would be all the way up here, and then you constantly move this. So next frame, since I assign back to it and I have this value, what's happened now? Well, now this is my new value. This is my new end value. And I'm getting 0 0.9 of that. So what happens is I'm now here. And so the effect you get is basically, can, it's, it's kind of like an ease out because you're converging on this kind of asymptote. But the problem is it's acting like an asymptote and you'll never get there because if you keep doing that and you keep going to 0 0.9, you can see how you'll never get to that final value, which again, may or may not be correct. So what I'm saying is, even though I don't really like doing it this way, and I would probably argue it's the incorrect way to do this what you could do is you could say um that like basically this should be my distance from player so this is kind of like my um let, let's say vector 2 target equals distance from player plus length which i guess we uh that's a float all oh, right um so float yeah uh but what I can do is I can say that actually my distance from player here, um, and actually let's do, let's do it this way, is going to be a lerp of distance from player to my target at like 0 0.7 or something like that. Uh, and this is, yeah, um, and then we have to obviously maintain this out here actually. So distance from player. 
So basically it ends up being like that. And that's what we kind of set it to. Um, now target. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so let's take a look at this. And that will kind of get us, if I've done it correctly, that kind of easing kind of motion. So you can see that it doesn't like... The thing is, it will still kind of... I guess it will, depending on how quickly that variable changes, you probably will see some kind of... Um, uh, you know, it will kind of zoom in quickly, unfortunately. I don't know if we can use a lower value and if that will even help. But you can see that you kind of get an animation out of it. Still kind of looks a bit... No, that doesn't really seem like it's working, to be honest. This is definitely the right thing, isn't it? Let's just see what this is. Because that's not exactly working as expected. <clears throat> no, I guess it is. I think it's just too quick. Because it is, it is pretty, well, yeah, it, I think it's just a bit too fast. Because target just changes so rapidly. I mean, I guess, like, if we actually keep lowering this, though, the thing is, because that gets reassigned back, I think it will just make it pretty much slower. Could even multiply it. Yes. Getting sick of seeing that all the time. <laughs> uh, we could just multiply it with um, delta time to kind of make it more or less dependent. Yeah, okay. Um, and see, the weird thing is, you can see that if we. Um, yeah, we don't get much precision, so it looks like it's actually working fine. But yeah, if we do multiply that with the time step, then the speed of it, and I can probably bump it up a bit, the speed of it will kind of be more or less in real world units. And it'll be dependent on, it won't, it'll, won't be dependent on your frame rate. So you can see that's kind of a slow zoom out. And then it just zooms in, but that's way too slow. So this is probably what I, what I was thinking of doing like zero point not, but this is like again, it's getting a little bit weird because again, like overall, I'd really hate um, using low up like this. Like, I try and avoid it as much as possible. Yeah, that's too slow. Um, so, I think what we do is, I mean, we could of course 
like we could boost it any other way but i kind of like the way that this feels so i might just leave it as that the problem again is that it's going to be dependent on your um on how often you call update well not really how often you call update. well you yeah, know yeah how often you call update is going to determine how that kind of behaves but yeah it kind of snaps in <laughs> which is pretty funny so anyway um it's probably it for today I hope you guys enjoyed this little, the beginning of this game called Face Run. Um, we really need text rendering. Uh, but aside from that, um, we're just going to have like some kind of game here where you have to, I don't know exactly how this should work. And if like, you know, because at the moment we can kind of control the player with WASD. I don't know if that's worth doing. Uh, or if we really want it to just be an automated game that just like we basically have to build up our level, obviously not using Hazelnut, but using the game. We just get to kind of build up our level, do whatever it is we want to do. Um, and then... Uh, And then we can, yeah, we'll see. So I don't know, game design's a bit lacking, but hopefully you guys in chat can help me out. Oscar does programming. Uh, yeah, glad glad my little drawing helped someone. <laughs> Question, this game will run on web? No. Um, so Hazel just supports Windows at the moment, but we'll support Linux and Mac and stuff as well. Okay, um, so yeah, thank you guys for watching. Don't forget you can like uh, check out the episodes on YouTube as well. I have, well, my main channel is just called The Cherno, but my... Uh, kind of the channel for this kind of stuff is called Cherno Unplugged. And um, you can uh, uh, catch all of the kind of recorded episodes of the Game Engine series on there. Um, I'm a little bit behind with them, but there's one coming out tonight and they'll be coming out throughout this week to catch up, hopefully. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, uh, thank you guys for watching. Don't forget, you can help support by going to patreon.com slash the Cherno and get access to Big Hazel, the real big engine <laughs> that's um hopefully getting a like a new kind of release this month that's what the team and i are working on and uh yeah thank you guys for watching i'll see you next time goodbye <laughs>